Perfect. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending our annual 2021 Hurricane Kickoff Seminar. Um, my name is Caroline Briones, and I'm an Emergency Management Coordinator with the City. And on behalf of the Division of Emergency Management, thank you all for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> well, without further ado, since we are just a few minutes late, I will get started and welcome our Mayor Gunter. I want to thank uh, everyone for uh, coming out tonight and attending and thank everyone who's watching at home. Hurricane preparedness is extremely important in our city. We need to be prepared for these uh, possible events that may come our way. I want to thank the city manager. I'd like to thank uh, Chief Lamb and our emergency management team that each and every year develop a plan so when these events do occur, that we know exactly how we're gonna move forward to make sure that our residents and our community are safe. And also, this is a, a team uh, event, so it's not only the city staff and emergency management team, it's also the residents. We're in this together. And as a team, we have to make sure that number one, we're safe, and number two, that we have a plan in place to identify what our needs are as a community moving forward. That only, not only starts here at the city level, that's, that starts in, in your home as well. So what I'm asking is all the residents of our city to develop their own plan. Where would they go? What do they need? And where, what is gonna be a safe environment for their families? And I think you have to address that and make sure you have that plan in place. This isn't something that you develop uh, the day before the storm gets here. This is something that you have to discuss with your family and know exactly how you are going to be prepared for this particular storm. Of course, we all have a desire that we won't find ourselves in that position, but unfortunately, any, any one of us that have lived here long enough has definitely uh, went through one of these storms. So what I'm asking our community is to develop that plan, work with our city leaders, make sure our community is safe and make sure that when this event does occur that we can get the needs of our community out there the quickest. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight. Work with our emergency management team. This is a team effort and uh, develop those plans at the city level and at home as well so we can make sure that our citizens are as safe as possible if and when a storm does come to our city. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Gunter. Um, as we move forward throughout the night, we will have a panel of about nine speakers with us. Um, we will be talking about everything from the hurricane season projections to evacuation zones, as well as how to use different mobile phone applications in an emergency. Um, please save your questions until the end. We will have a Q&A segment at the very end. Um, but with that, I will let Fire Chief Lamb present. I'm gonna go mobile. I uh, appreciate everybody for coming out tonight. Um, we were kind of nervous to see with COVID and that winding down what, uh, what we were gonna see. We weren't able to do one last year. Um, but the good news is, is since there's a limited crowd tonight, you guys uh, have a lot more opportunity to get your questions asked. So I know what she just said, questions to the end. I don't mind if you ask them along the way. Uh, it'll be much more interactive. And that way you just don't have me as a talking head up here the whole time. Um, but certainly, uh, we've got a great group of folks uh, for you to, to hear from tonight uh, that are experts in their field and also are new somewhat in their positions. And so they got some fresh ideas and some different ways we want to look at things moving into the future. So um, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the fire department and how we operate as a city in response to an emergency. So one of the things that we look at in a, an emergency management is we can't always predict exactly what the disaster is going to be or when it's going to impact us, but we can be what we call all hazards. We can be prepared for any disaster and with a base level and then adjust to the variables as they present. 
And so when we look at the 2021 hurricane season, I'm not going to touch on the, the, the forecast because the new chief meteorologist for Winkton News is going to hit, hit on that or some of the, the sheltering or evacuation things because we got Lee County's emergency management director here to, to hit on those things. Uh, I'm going to focus, like I said, a little bit more on the fire department and then our emergency management folks will touch on some of the rest. So looking at the, the hurricane season this year, we know it's going to be an active season and it's one that we, to follow on what the mayor said, it's something we need to prepare for now to make sure we're prepared because if we're prepared now, then that's going to make us a resilient community. And when we talk about being a resilient community, it means when that storm or that disaster impacts us, we'll be able to get back up going uh, quickly as residents to make sure we have good quality of life and get our businesses and economy back up and running. Oh, I, I need the clicker. All right, so if anybody's th see, uh, seen this, this is a risk frequency analysis. So we look at things that are high risk, low frequency. So thankfully, uh, and hopefully they don't become uh, of regular frequency, but a hurricane for us is a low frequency but a high risk event. And then we go into what we call discretionary and non-discretionary time, right? Time to think and plan and then time not to think and plan. So when that storm is 24 hours outside of our area, it's really hard to make a, make a good plan uh, in that emotional state and with the different variables at that time. So it's important we take advantage of days like today when it's a beautiful day outside uh, to make those plans in preparation of those emergency events. So as far as fire rescue goes, again, that's what I'm going to primarily touch on and let the, everybody else handle the other issues. When we look at fire rescue, um, our firefighters in response to a storm, we're going to go out and we're going to do all sorts of things to help prep. Um, we will do in limited cases for elderly or dis disabled folks, we'll go out and help them put up their shutters. Um, we're going to be working on all of our preparations. We bring in extra firefighters at, to the fire stations. We also bring in PD and public works into the fire stations because we do what's called first push. And I'll touch on that in just a second. But in preparation, as you can imagine, there's heightened emotions. People are out doing strenuous things that they're not normally doing. So all of our firefighters are also EMTs and paramedics. So we're seeing an increase in calls and demand. Um, for normal service where we're trying to heighten up what we're doing in the fire department as well. So as far as emergency services, at when the winds reach a sustained 45 miles an hour, we stop our emergency response. At that point, it's dangerous for our responders to go out. Where at that point, we're starting to see projectiles and some other things might be caught up in the wind, so it's not safe for our firefighters and police officers to be back out. And again, when when they'll touch on this later, but when we call for evacuations, this is one of those things that we're watching for, and it's not done haphazardly. It's something we want to do, and it's calculated to make sure uh, we can protect our residents. So, like I mentioned, something called first push, all of our fire stations become little community hubs. And so at a fire station, coming out after the storms uh, have passed and the winds have, have laid down, you're going to have a front-end loader, a cop car, and a fire truck. And they're going to come back out, and their primary job is going to be trying to clear the major arterials, then the branch roads, and the neighborhood roads. However, we also have calls and holding. And I think after Hurricane Irma, and I call Hurricane Irma a um, least case scenario, I don't think we can expect less um, from, a, from a storm. And in that situation, as limited as that was, we had about 150 emergency calls and holding. And so based off of that, we have uh, folks in our dispatch center that are going to work with um, our crews to determine which the priority call to go to. So obviously somebody having a, a heart attack is going to take priority versus a uh, palm from sparking on a limb. That's going to be one of the ones that we're going to wait and get to here in a little bit. It'll burn off and it'll be nothing by the time we get there anyway. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that we look at when we're, when we're responding to emergencies and, and when we start and stop that process. Generators, and I know um, LCEC is going to touch a lot more on how to properly connect it and do all those fun things. Um, but one of the things that it does for us is um, we go around and we actually listen for generators sometimes post-storm in, in some of the impacted areas. Because if we hear a generator that's muffled, we know it's inside somebody's garage. That's a bad, bad recipe, right? Carbon monoxide, that odorless, uh, colorless gas. I don't smell anything. Oh, yeah, it's uh, slowly, is, it has taken some lives, and that's something that's, that's dangerous and we'll, we'll continue to look out for and watch. The other thing I want to touch on is that uh, a lot of times when somebody's power goes out, if their oven was on or their dishwasher or some of their stovetop stuff was on, I see people then stack stuff on top of it, then the power comes back on. And uh, after uh, that we started restoring power after Hurricane Irma, we saw about a 150% increase in structure fires. Um, so it's a very active time, even post-storm, for us as a fire department. Candles, uh, again, as we're seeing um, 
you know, loss of power, those other things. Really want to emphasize using um, battery powered things. Uh, certainly, we don't want to add heat because <laughs> it's going to be, be hot, but we also get concerns of you, know, you start putting these candles all over the house, they get close to uh, windows. We make house calls, but you don't want to see us. Yeah. So certainly, uh, something to be concerned about. Something we get a lot of questions about, and uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get uh, the Coast Guard here with us tonight, but we'll try and get them next year, is how do we deal with a boat? Um, so does anybody in here have boats? Yeah, so we, we were a boating community, and how do we best prepare our boat for a hurricane? And so one of the best things that I recommend is dry docking. If you can get it out of the water and into a marina, that's one of the best places for it. Um, and the marinas sh should have contingency plans on what they're going to do to help secure their boats. But a lot of times we see a boat either at a dock or on a lift. So they recommend taking that lift all the way up and then uh, giving enough slack in your rope. Uh, there's a fine line there because if it gets too tight on your rope, if you don't give it enough slack, you'll actually lift it. It can either uh, take the boat down or it can snap the line. And then on a trailer, they recommend um, trying to put some straps and stakes over it to stake it down. Obviously, if you can move it out of a high wind area, that would be the, the best option. I've seen some other things where they talk about trying to put some water in the boat. Uh, I personally would not recommend that uh, because you're going to continue to get lots of rainfall and you're going to continue to flood out your boat. You're going to break your trailer. All those things, I would definitely keep that bilge uh, and drain plug out. So talk a little bit about... Um, declaring a local state of emergency. I'm going to touch a little bit on this. So the city manager in our city has the power, duty, and responsibility to declare uh, a st local state of emergency in advance of something coming. And so there's a process that he has to go through in order to do that. And one of the key points I want to make here is the city manager can. It doesn't mean that it automatically happens. There's this whole giant list of things to do. So implement emergency plans, emergency expenditures, um, enact a curfew, and one of the popular ones, ban the sale of, or suspend the sale of alcohol. Uh, everybody thinks as soon as we declare a state of emergency, you know, you have to go buy all the beer and wine and liquor you can immediately. No, that's not the case. Um, we, uh, that is an option and will be enacted if, if there's a need for that, but that's not an immediate thing that happens. But a lot of the things it does let us do is get onto private property and collect debris, which is one of the biggest issues we see after a hurricane, um, is the amount of especially horticulture debris that we see throughout our city. You'll see after Hurricane Irma, again, not a major hurricane by any stretch, but we had giant mounds of uh, horticulture debris that got stuck on city property until it could get uh, ground up and take away. Uh, just to touch a little bit on our reimbursement process uh, and how we get declarations. And again, there'll be some other people that are, might go more in depth than this one. But a lot of times we hear, oh, this is going to be reimbursable or the federal government's going to come in and step in. Reimbursement's not 100%. And it takes a really long time. And your paperwork better be squared away because if not, the federal government will make sure they get theirs. And so just one of those things as we work through that process that um, we have to be financially conscious because we don't want to cripple our city in response to a, a storm. We've seen some places like uh, Mexico Beach after Hurricane Michael that what that did to that community. And you know, when all you lose all your houses, you also lose all the property value associated with that. And what does that do for your budgets moving forward to be able to provide cops, firefighters, trash pickup, all those fun things. So again, uh, mine was kind of light and overviewed, um, but does anybody have questions about the, the fire department? I know we're going to get into some more specific things or any of the topics I touched on. All right, well, I'll be sticking around for a little bit, and uh, I'm going to introduce you to uh, my right-hand man when it comes to emergency situations. Uh, Alvin Henderson is our emergency management division manager. It's a long title, but he's in charge of emergency <coughs> management here for us for the city. Alvin? Thank you, Chief. Okay, uh, as the Chief said, uh, I'm likewise going to be kind of brief as well because we really want to get into the uh, subject matter experts that have uh, agreed to come here and uh, work with us and present to you all today. Uh, but there are a few things I wanted to try to cover uh, so you're aware of what we're doing within the emergency management uh, division within the city. One of the things that we look at is the community as a whole. Uh, we're embarking upon a new FEMA construct, FEMA being the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, they have a new construct called Community Lifelines. And what you see is the seven groupings of the main uh, safety and security issues that a community would look at. So we're trying to make sure that those uh, main needed services like fire, police, utilities, those types of items that you're 
live by in a community are being uh, provided to the community before, during, and after a storm, and if they're interrupted, to quickly recover those services so we could restore the community back to the way it was. Each of those groupings have several subcomponents to it, so if you see with the safety and security group, uh, those other groups there make up all the other subcomponents that we look at for safety and security. So we're looking at the electric, the water, you know, making sure that all those needed services are being provided to the city. We have representatives that come into the emergency operations center and they're looking at their grids, in essence, on those services that they're providing and making sure that they're aware of how the storm is impacting those services. But then we prioritize needs of the community to make sure that we could quickly res restore any of those services that have been disrupted. One of the questions we get asked a lot, ICE. Uh, do we provide it? And as you see, the answer is no. And there's a few reasons for that. Uh, first, it's a large energy, en energy and resource demand on our system. Uh, as you can imagine, we're in the summer. It's a short duration that it lasts for us without keeping it into a freezer. Uh, what we try to do is, through our community lifelines, we're wor working very closely with the businesses throughout the city of Cape Coral to make sure that they can maintain their services to the community. I'm sure you've probably heard and seen pictures of uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency will come in and set up a point of distribution, they're called pods, and they'll have ice and water and other types of uh, necessities for the community. That is very labor intensive and logistically it is a nightmare to try to manage all those resources to quickly get those out to the community. Our strategy here in the city of Cape Coral is to work with all of our local businesses that provide those community lifeline services making sure that they maintain their capabilities of providing those services to the community. Therefore, if you need ice, you can most likely go to a local uh, gas station, convenience store, get ice, or go to your Publix or Walmart or Target and get ice and other types of commodities that you would need that typically would be uh, supported out of a pod. But again, we're trying to make sure that we're being uh, working collaboratively with our uh, business community and they're providing those services that they do rather well day in and day out. We talk a lot about run from the water, hide from the wind. Uh, the reason why we want you to run from the water, if you take a look at the causes of death in the United States for Atlantic tropical cyclones from 1963 through 2012, 49% of those deaths are associated with storm surge. Another 27% with rain and surf 6%, so that's a large component that water is creating a, a large danger to the community. So we want you to run from that water, we don't want you to hide from it. With that thought in mind, when people say, okay, are you gonna supply us sandbags? The answer to that is no, and there's reason behind that. As you see in the pictorial here, for a appropriately designed sandbag, process, your width of the sandbags is three times the height. So if you're going to try to protect an opening that, say, is five foot high, you have to multiply that by three. That's how wide that has to be as you set up your sandbags. Other issues, it takes a lot of time. It's not something that's done very easily. Again, we'd rather you run from the water and evacuate to a friend and family outside of the evacuation zone. Also, you can see it can block egress. So as you're putting these around your home, you're actually blocking your egress to get out of your home. Uh, they're, therefore, they're really not effective. And then if you also look in the picture up here from time consuming, that's one of the areas that we as a fire department see a lot of injuries taking place. It is labor intensive. It's heavy sand that you're working with. And it tends to create a situation where we see a lot of heart attacks occur during that type of operation. Then also, if you take a look at storm inundation, you know, an entire neighborhood could be engulfed by water. So again, if you take a look, you know, your typical garage door opening is at least eight foot in height. Some have 10 foot high garage doors. When you go back to the mathematics of it, you would need a whole lot of sand and a whole lot of sandbags, many more than what anybody or any agency would give to you. So it makes it, uh, not practical to do that type of operation, let alone typically 
What do you end up getting in your floodwaters? Do you start to see petroleum-based products in there or other hazardous materials in there? So then all these sandbags and the sand become hazardous materials and have to be uh, go gone to a hazardous materials waste incinerator, in essence, and then burned off. Uh, the other thing that we talk about is hide from the wind. That wind is based on, again, the category storm that we're seeing. Again, just a real quick category one through five and what type of winds that we could see from that. What you want to do then is go to interior room of your home. Uh, ideally, small closet areas are ideal. As you see from this picture here, the house is pretty much devastated, but a small closet is still intact. So if you see that type of high wind coming, get away from the windows. Again, you know, hopefully you have shutters up or plywood over the windows, but again, it's best to get into the interior most room of your home. And then if you have a closet area, because of construction with that, that's the safest place to be during that high wind event. Things that we want you to do though, we talked about, you know, again, we don't give out ice, we're not wanting you to do sandbags. Now's the time to prepare for the storm. Uh, the first graph over on the left talks about insurance. It's a great time to reach out now under the blue skies that we have here today. Talk to your insurance agent. See what your insurance package is for your home. Is there any uh, underinsure uh, issues that you might have to address? Uh, are you prepared for any type of emergency that would require you to call upon your insurance agent? Do you have his or her name and number? Now's a great time, too, to take pictures. They always say a picture is worth a thousand words. So still photography and also video are ideal. That way you document what your home looks like pre-storm. And it can save you a lot of time, energy, and effort after the storm goes through, and especially if you have to then uh, file an insurance claim. Also strengthening your home. Uh, rather than filling sandbags, do the typical things that we're calling out here. Clear debris away from your home. Trim your trees back. Uh, if you have a trampoline, that's an excellent time to take the trampoline down rather than having it become a projectile, uh, as they often do. Take it down, put it inside the house. Uh, other items you want to store is all your patio furniture. Bring that in and secure it. So those are the type of actions that don't take a lot of time, but allow you to be better prepared and prepare your family and home from that event as it occurs. So again, have that family emergency plan. Uh, evacuations, we don't have to run to another state. Many times we're looking at evacuation zones that we might be able to go just a few miles inland to other friends and family's home and ride that storm out. Uh, you don't have to then go to another state. We talk a lot about evacuation shelters. I know Sandra's gonna talk about it in her presentation. Uh, it's really a last resort type of item. If you're saying that a shelter is your primary evacuation point, Think about it again. Evacuation shelter, you're going to get a concrete floor that's taped off, a little space for you to have your cot, your food, and your family during an event. It's not real comfortable. So again, it's best to look at that evacuation if you are in an evacuation zone to actually look at friends and family just outside those evacuation zones and know and talk to them in advance uh, so you have a plan with them that you and your family could uh, go to their home and ride that storm out. The chief already covered this one. Uh, the last slide I have talks about what should that go kit look like. Uh, one of the things that I always like to cover is the fact that toilet paper, uh, pretty much four rolls of toilet paper per person uh, for three days is plenty. So if you're a family of six, a 24 roll package is plenty. All right, <laughs> we don't need six packages of uh, toilet paper. But those are some of the items that you might wanna think about uh, to have in your go kit or uh, in your home ready to go during our hurricane season. <clears throat> all right, that's all I have. We'll uh, bring on the next, Sandra, the Lee County Emergency Management Director, the newly appointed. She was interim for what, three months, four months? And then June 3rd, she now became the permanent director. So we're excited to have her here with us this evening. Very good. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you. And I do need that. Yes. Thank you so much.
thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to be here. I know we have a bunch of people online that are participating as well. Uh, so my name is Sandra Tapfumine, and as Alvin said, I am the Emergency Management Director for Lee County. And today I'm going to focus on sharing information on evacuations and sheltering. So why do we call for evacuations? You've been hearing a lot about storm surge and wind today, and really those are the reasons that we would call for an evacuation. When we see that there is a lot of storm surge that is coming from a storm, we are monitoring that along the way and getting information from the National Hurricane Center. And as you probably know, if you've lived in Lee County and Cape Coral for any length of time, we don't have a lot of elevation where we live, right? We, we come to live in Southwest Florida because of the beaches, because of the sunny weather, uh, but unfortunately the, the downside of living here is the fact that we are extremely low lying. So for us, that means if we do have a storm that does bring significant storm surge, that is an abnormal rise of the water that is coming and potentially being pushed up onto the land, there is not a lot of options for us in Lee County. Uh, the good news, I always like to tell people, especially if you're new to the area, a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about hurricanes. The one good thing about hurricanes is that you know that they're coming, right? So I'm from the Midwest, and in the Midwest, what are we concerned about? Tornadoes, right? And we don't get a lot of warning for tornadoes. You have to try really hard to not know a hurricane is coming, right? So that's a good thing because that does give you an opportunity to leave. We're going to talk about evacuating if that applies to you um, and, and to be prepared. And you guys are already one step ahead by being here today. So kudos for you. Um, but back to storm surge. So storm surge, again, that is the number one reason that we call for evacuations. And Alvin is right. We do not want you riding out your in your home if there is a potential for a significant amount of storm surge to reach your home. Not a, not a, a situation you want to be in. It could also be for wind. If you are living in a mobile or manufactured home, or we like to say homes that were built before the Hurricane Andrew codes, uh, that storm affected our Florida building codes, so roughly the early 2000s or so and after, you should be good for most storms that we're gonna have and experience here in the county. But if you're living in an older home, then wind might also be a factor. Um, and, and we would also be calling for people that live on boats. If you're uh, fortunate enough to be somebody that lives on a boat, you don't definitely do not wanna be riding out the storm there. Um, or if you have special needs, special medical needs, and you don't want to stay in an area, we will likely experience uh, electrical outages and power outages. I know we have um, LCEC here to tell us all about that here in a moment. Uh, so the other point here is that evacuation orders are mandatory. So if we call for an area that you are living in and that is you know, in a part of the evacuating area, it is mandatory, i.e. against the law for you to stay in your home because of the fact that, you know, you're, I'm sure your police chief is not going to come with his folks and drag you out of your house, um, but the first responders are not going to be able to get to you, and they do not want you to be stuck and stranded somewhere that they cannot reach you. So the reason we're calling for that evacuation is it's safer for you to move than it is to stay in your home. And we don't take that lightly because we know evacuating is not an enjoyable experience. We totally understand and agree with you on that. But that is why we make that call, and this is the reason. So this is our evacuation zone map. Now, again, I told you that we are very low-lying. Most other counties in Florida, not in Southwest Florida, because they're all in the same boat as us, um, but most other counties in Florida do not have this beautiful colored map with all these bright colors on it because their evacuation zones are a lot smaller and that has a lot to do with their elevation and the fact that on our coast, the Gulf of Mexico is very shallow and there's no continental shelf to catch that water as it potentially could be coming up on shore. So for us, again, this is a very significant concern when it comes to storm surge. So if you live in Cape Coral, which I'm assuming most of you do, then you live in an evacuation zone. The other thing that we get a lot of questions on is, how does this relate to my flood zone? So those are two different maps. The flood zone has to do with freshwater flooding. And this evacuation zone map has to do with this, again, this water that could be coming up 
from a storm. So it's important to understand both maps, but know that this is the one that we will be looking at when a storm is approaching. So again, if you live anywhere in the red area, zone A, red is zone A. If you live in the uh, orange area, that's zone B. And then C is yellow. My, my plea for you is that if you live in any of those three zones, that you have a really good evacuation plan in place. And Alvin is right. We don't necessarily encourage you to go hundreds of miles away. Uh, we would encourage you to find somebody that lives maybe out in Lehigh in that white area, right? Or possibly even in the E, the purple evacuation zone, or the D evacuation zone, that green area. That way you're just going you know, maybe a few dozen miles away instead of 100 miles away, and then you're not having to fight with the traffic and, and the elements. Um, this map is available. I did bring some of our all-hazard guides, so if you're here in the room, uh, this information is in this guide. And if you are watching online, you can go to our website at leegov, L-E-E-G-O-V dot com forward slash hurricane. And there's a bunch of information on preparedness there, but also in the guide, you can take the map with you. Also on our website, if you plug in your um, address, it will tell you which zone that you live in. I know we're asking you to look at a map, which is a little hard uh, for some people because we are so reliant on our cell phones these days. So if you need some help with that, you can go enter in your, your address and find it there. So Alvin was also correct by saying that we do not encourage you to go to a shelter. Uh, it would be very much more comfortable for you to go to a friend's house, a hotel, another location. Shelters are really there for people that it is their absolute last resort and therefore they are heading to a shelter. But if that is you and you're in that situation, we will open shelters before we call for the evacuation because we want to make sure that people can get there um, and, and have a safe place to shelter. So we have two kinds of shelters. One is a general population shelter. Uh, all of them are pet friendly. And in the Cape, your shelter is the Island Coast High School. Special needs shelters are for people who are dependent on electricity, or maybe they have some more critical health uh, concerns or needs, and so the Department of Health partners with us, and they place those individuals on a special needs list, and we would put them into a special needs shelter run by the Department of Health. It does require pre-registration, though. So if you know somebody that's in that category, again, they can go to our website, and register ahead of time for that storm, or for that, for that shelter. If you're coming with a pet, we do encourage you to bring a cage, all the supplies that you need for, your, for, your, um, for yourself and for your pet, um, but food, water, medication, any items to help clean up after your pet. This is really, really important. We had a lot of people in Hurricane Irma, they weren't prepared to evacuate, and so they showed up with cats and pillowcases and snakes and pillowcases and all those kinds of things. So everyone would appreciate if you could put your pets in a cage. That would be much appreciated. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to mention briefly, we have a system called alertly.com. If you would like to sign up for that, that's a website. It allows you to tie your cell phone to your home address. So when we call for evacuations, uh, we, would, we would do that based off of the geography of the um, county. You can get that alert even if you're not in your home. So that's a great site to sign up for. And then also Lee Prepares is an app. It's a free app download. And it has a lot of preparedness information uh, similar to what you're hearing today. And it also allows you to get current information of what we have open and resources during a storm. So the shelters will be updated then. If we do have points of distribution or other resources, that's where we would go to post them. So with that, any questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, do we have any services available for people who are disabled? And you gave the example about needing transportation, perhaps, right? So they can also register on our special needs web registration. If it's a transportation uh, piece that we can help them with, we can get them connected with that resource. We have a disability working group that works with our office. So if there's spe specific needs, help with planning, they can reach out and we can help them with that. Yep. Okay, very good. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Sandra. Next up, we have Chief of Police, Chief Sizemore. Thank you. I'm uh, Chief Tony Sizemore, the police chief with Cape Coral. I do not have a PowerPoint. I'm more of a uh, fireside chat kind of guy. So uh, my contribution to uh, hurricane uh, discussion tonight is more of a post-storm. Uh, I will give one piece of advice for pre-storm. Um, everything that was said before and will be said after is spot on as far as preparing your home. One thing I would ask you to do for storms and also for crime prevention in general is get to know your neighbors. Have a, have a pre-hurricane block party and get to know who's who, exchange numbers, because in the event of a non-mandatory, <coughs> excuse me, a non-mandatory evacuation, you may choose to leave or some of your neighbors may choose to leave and to have a point of contact back home to get updates is really something to give you peace of mind. Um, and also it will help you in the post-storm uh, efforts that I'm gonna speak of today. Uh, in the event that you evacuate and are coming back, the city of Cape Coral does not have an ordinance or an official procedure for registration of those who are leaving and a check-in or an authorization to come back into town or into your neighborhood. Um, it would be a logistical nightmare for us to be able to do that. Uh, tempers are already high, uh, anxieties are very high, and then to wait in a very long line to show identification or have some documentation that you may or may not have could be very problematic. So people are allowed to enter and exit the community pre and post storm. Uh, what I would advise everybody to do is to uh, exercise caution, both emotionally, the emotional temperature will be high when you're coming back, have patience, drive safely. A lot of people are in the same boat you are, anxious about the state of their home, Maybe they don't have that network of neighbors to find out and they don't know what they're driving into. Um, be very careful of standing water when you're driving back. You don't know the depth of the water. Uh, there may be debris uh, exposed. There may be hidden debris. There may be power lines down, depending on how early you re-enter the community. And then uh, upon doing a damage assessment, one of the things that we see is people's um, uh, emotions are high, they're, they're angry, very anxious and they want to get things fixed immediately and you need help and what I don't want to do is is scare you to where you don't take good help or welcome help if you have neighbors with a chainsaw and um, ability to help you move debris and do good neighborly free things don't be so afraid to to not accept their help if you need help take the help uh, be mindful of something that we call uh, a gypsy scam, where you're distracted in the front by a stranger and people go around and make entry into your home or steal your belongings. Um, take help from people that are trusted. Uh, and then if you find yourself getting into a position where you need more than just neighborly help, you need uh, paid help, contractors, you need roofing work, you need electrical work, you need any type of trades work, be very mindful of unlicensed predatory contractors. And I won't go deep into that because my good friend Bill Johnson from the Cape Coral Construction Industry Association will touch on that in depth. But you're going you're gonna to be looking for help, any type of handout, and people prey upon that. And we ask you to please be mindful. Um, and even some of the wonderful contractors that we have that are licensed and ready to work, they know this, but you need to check with your insurance company before you start having paid work done. There are adjusters that are in town. They bring in a, in a hard hit area. Extra insurance adjusters will come down and pave that way for you to do it properly because what you don't want to do is get into a position where you've been taken by an unlicensed contractor. Somebody gets injured on your property and then you're liable. Permits weren't pulled or your insurance company won't pay for it after the fact because you didn't go through the right channels or use um, legitimate contractors or even a legitimate contractor that you went outside of the scope of the requirements of your personal homeowner's policy. So be mindful of scams. Uh, it's a very sad part of society, but in people's times of need, there are many that will prey upon uh, those in their most uh, vulnerable position and that's what we would ask you to do is be very cautious of that and develop that as part of that planning 
that everybody was talking about. One thing that often gets overlooked is getting to know those in your community, your immediate neighborhood, and it's a good thing for blue skies as well. You know what's, what's normal, what's out of place, develop that sense of community, especially those that are new here, get to know those neighbors, especially some that have been through Char Charlie, Wilma, Irma, they can kind of give you the, the lowdown on what to expect in a storm. So again, I will leave a lot of the in-depth talk about uh, what I touched on to some other guests and experts here, but I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be here to meet our, newcomer, our newcomers, and thank you to those online and on Cape TV who are watching today. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Sizemore. Next up, we have Chief Meteorologist from Wink News, Matt Devitt. Please welcome him. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So, no question, we live in a beautiful area. We got the perfect weather most of the time. We have the beautiful sandy beaches, but we do have every now and then a price for living in paradise, and that's the occasional hurricane. Now, if I had all the power in the world, I wish that we didn't have to deal with these type of tropical systems. But when we do, all of you will be prepared, and you will have a plan. So going forward in this presentation, what we'll do is we'll talk about and prepare for storms in the future by very briefly looking at the past. So who was here during Irma? Just a quick show of hands. Now, there is no question, this was a storm that we watched, and we watched for almost a week and a half as it made this huge trek across the Atlantic, 3,000 miles from start to finish. And during that trek, during the 3,000 miles, it was able to grow bigger and bigger and also stronger. Where you see the pink shading, that is actually where it was a Category 5. Now, thankfully for us, it did not hit us as a Category 5, but it still had a significant impact on our area. So here's actually a look at Irma, September 10th in the morning hours when it made landfall in the Florida Keys. The worst part of the storm and the, s the part of the storm that you want to avoid is what we call the eye wall. You can see that red little donut that the Keys were experiencing early that morning. By the time it made it towards us, making landfall on Marco Island, it was a category three. So if you're brand new to Florida, we base the intensity of these hurricanes off of the Saffir Simpson scale. It's a one to five scale. Now, a category one by no means is a weak storm, but it's not a three, it's not a four, it's not a five. But even a category one can have quite an impact on a community. I'm gonna show you that here in a second. But when Irma made landfall across our area, it was a category three. Some of us had their lives altered by Irma in big ways. Others, not so much. Now, I wanna do a quick recap of what Irma did in every single dynamic. First off, the wind speeds. The highest wind gusts I had was 142 miles an hour at Naples Airport. Look at some of the damage that was in Collier County. The next thing, and thank you so much for all the presentations before me. They hit this hard and they did a great job of it. How you should run away from the water. Get away from that storm surge. That, that is the deadliest part of a hurricane. And I know the storm surge topic was real big with Irma. But to be honest with you, most of our area got lucky. We dodged a bullet. And the reason why we did dodge a bullet is because Irma at the last minute shifted 40 miles to the east. It took the worst storm surge with it 40 miles to the east. If it went according to projections, that could have been Fort Myers Beach. That could have been Sanibel. That could have been at the Lighthouse. Could also be the Naples Pier. I cannot stress how critical with a landfalling tropical system, every single mile counts. This was in our area, but it was near Everglade City and Plantation Island southern parts of Collier County. This could have very well been Lee County. With Irma, again, can't stress enough how lucky we got. And it was because it made that jog right at the last minute to the east by around 30 and 40 miles. So it's not only the saltwater flooding 
that we need to prepare for, but it's also the freshwater flooding. Now, if you have a very good memory, if you were here during Irma, two weeks prior, we had a significant rainfall event that saturated the grounds. And then you bring on the rainfall from Irma, and it made the situation even worse. Flooding happened very quickly. Again, I don't recommend this. I don't know what was going on in this picture. Uh, those must be some really nice shoes. But again, goes without saying, please don't ever, ever, ever venture out in floodwaters. We don't know if there are gators in there. We don't know if there are down power lines under the water. Fire ants, water moccasins, please never, ever, ever venture out in floodwaters. Buckingham had some of the most rainfall. That's the picture that we're looking at here, 8 to 14 inches on top of what they already had two weeks prior. The next graphic, so let's advance it another year. Irma was 2017. Michael was 2018. This was the first landfall in Category 5 in the United States since Hurricane Andrew in 1992. It was the third most intense landfall that the U.S. has ever seen on record. But Michael, 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 if there is one graphic in this entire presentation, it's this one right here. And it's why everybody is here today and why I want you to prepa prepare for hurricane season as early as you can. Do it when it's sunny and when it's quiet, just like today and not at the last minute because of Michael. So why Michael? Why, why was that a learning experience? Can everybody see the bottom line? It went from a nothing to a something in three days. It went from a tropical depression, 30 mile an hour winds, 35 mile an hour, mile an hour winds, rain and storms, very disorganized, to a landfall in Category 5 in three days. Three days, that's all it took. So you can, you, you can even see the timeline, October 7th, tropical depression, and then October 10th, just three days later, landfall in Category 5. And the strongest storm that the United States has seen since Andrew in 1992. So why is storm surge the deadliest part of a storm? So why do we have storm surge? Well, what happens is wind is a force. The stronger the hurricane that you have, the stronger the wind and the stronger the force. So you are literally forcing the Gulf of Mexico from Mexico Beach to the Florida Panhandle, but also for us if we have a landfalling storm. So you have that greater force shoving the Gulf potentially up the street, miles and miles on end. And I want to show you an example of a before and after of what storm surge can do. This was just three years ago. This was Mexico Beach in the Florida Panhandle. Here's before and here's after. And that is why if you are told to evacuate, you need to do so. And it's because of scenes like this. Cannot stress enough how powerful storm surge can be and how deadly it can be. Now, granted, this was a Category 5, but anything is possible for us when it comes to hurricanes. Category 1 through 5. Analysis was done after Michael that determined, can you guys see the center of the graphic, that number? Storm surge was 19 feet. And remember how we led the, the Michael segment? Three days prior, it was nothing. And three days later, 19 feet storm surge. The earlier that you guys can prep for hurricane season, the better. So let's now advance to last year. Looks like a bowl of spaghetti, right? It was that active. We had 30 storms, 14 hurricanes, and seven major hurricanes. Now, if you were living in Florida in 2004, remember when we were hit by one storm after another? It was quite a season. Well, that's what Louisiana had last year. Louisiana had a horrendous year one after another, powerful storms. To be honest with you, we largely did well. We weren't completely immune. We did have one storm that gave us a glancing blow. The date was very unusual. We had Thanksgiving two weeks later. This was Ada. So the specific date, it was November 11, 2020. And I'm going to show you pictures here in a second. This storm was 100 miles off the coast, 100 miles off the coast as just a Category 1. Keep that in mind. Here's some of the pictures. So the picture on the left, that is going to be Matt Lachey to and from. And the picture on the right, you ever been to uh, Pierside Grill, Fort Myers Beach? Look at the waves. Again, it stayed 100 miles off the coast. Never made landfall, but that is what it did along our coastline. It also brought significant rainfall, turned a yard into a lake in Fort Myers. 
And then we also had, uh, the highest wingus I had was about 69 and 70, and that was uh, enough to uproot some trees, and that picture on the right is from Englewood. Then, look at Sanibel Ca the Sanibel Causeway, to and from. And if you look very closely, let's hope that there were not any kids on that school bus. If you look very closely at the image, with the huge waves on the right, and then the causeway on the left. And again, to reiterate, 100 miles off the coast as a Category 1. That is the power of these storms. So why did we see such an active year? It was the most active on record. We had 11 U.S. landfalls, $51 billion worth of damage, and we almost had a Category 5. Uh, believe it or not, IOTA was a Category 5, downgraded it a few weeks ago, so we actually didn't have any Category 5s last year. But with 30 storms, one of the big components was what you see on the bottom right-hand portion of the image. It was because of La Nina. La Nina is when you have cooler waters in the eastern Pacific, which can alter weather patterns up in the atmosphere. There's a direct correlation, and then it comes over into the Atlantic and lowers our wind shear. So if you're brand new to Florida, lower the wind shear. Do we see more storms, but we see stronger storms? Now, on the flip side, El Nino, we like El Nino. That's the, that's the better brother. We like that one. El Nino, it's the exact opposite. You would have higher wind shear, and that would help to not only lower the amount of storms, but also potentially keep them weaker. So La Nina, we don't like that. El Nino, that's at least the better of the two scenarios. So that brings us into this year, 2021. Are we going to have an El Nino or a La Nina? The answer is actually neither. So I know this is going to look a little confusing. Let me walk you through it. So on the left-hand portion of the image, that is our starting point as of today. And then going into time, you will notice that the majority of these lines and the various models that project if we have El Nino or La Nina are kind of in the middle. Okay, so again, El Nino, that's what we want. That helps us out during hurricane season. We don't want to be in the blue. That is La Nina. The lower we go, the more likely that we would have a season like we did last year. So we're in the middle. So the current La Nina, El Nino models are showing that we would be neutral. But even if that occurs, granted we would not have 30 storms like we had last year, if the models are correct, but that doesn't mean we still would not have an above average year. Here's why. Got to factor in the temperatures. I literally took this image last night. This is how we are currently situated with water temps across the entire Atlantic. Now, I'm sure you can see this back here. We have a lot more orange than we do blue. Water temperatures are warmer than average across, I would say, a good chunk of the Gulf, most of the Caribbean, as well as the open Atlantic. Warmer the water temperatures, the more power and the fuel that you would have to not only develop tropical systems, but to make them stronger. So that is one of the ingredients that is hurting us. What's helping us is that we don't have as strong of a La Nina like we did last year, but even a neutral level would have us with more storms than normal. So here's the forecast from NOAA. On a given year, a typical year, if you look on the left, we would see 14 tropical storms, seven hurricanes, and three major hurricanes, and that's category three and above. The forecast on the right, NOAA, they are calling for 13 to 20. When it comes to hurricanes, about 6 to 10. And then major hurricanes, 3 to 5. Now, I get asked this question a lot. You know, how much weight do you put onto these forecasts? You know, do you, do you think about it a lot? Do you stress it a lot? To be honest with you, I don't. I don't. I look at it and say, okay, yeah, above average year. But let me show you examples why I don't put a lot of weight into it. I'm going to show you two examples. 2010. 2010 was an above average year. We had 19 storms. We had 12 hurricanes. We had five major hurricanes. But guess what? Doesn't mean they all went here. And where the strongest storms were during this above average year, look at the maroon lines. Those are the most powerful storms. They all curved out to sea during this above average year. So whenever you see those predictions, I don't want it to scare you. You know, if you ever hear it on the internet or the news or, and obviously with Wink, I'll try to keep them at bay, all right? I'll see, I'll see if I can work my magic. 
But I just, I don't want the anxiety levels to go up. I don't want the stress levels to go up when you hear those projections, okay? Because that doesn't mean that they're all coming here. You could have cases, like in 2010, where most of them curve out to C. How about the flip side? 1992, only seven storms. That was a below average year. We only had one major hurricane. Guess what the major hurricane was? Andrew. Do you think that the people in southern Florida would say that that was a below average year? Absolutely not. So my message, folks, I do not care what these outlooks say because all it takes is one storm. And 1992 is the classic example of that. That was a below average year, seven storms, but we had Andrew. A storm that South Florida will never forget and it changed the landscape. Okay, so we have actually already kicked off the season early, and that makes it seven years in a row and counting. Uh, there's been some talk that we may officially bump up the start of the season. You may have heard this. Instead of June 1st, May 15th, despite what happens down the road with the official, you know, it's not like Mother Nature says, oh, June 1st, let's spin it up. No, Mother Nature can develop these whenever it wants. It just so happens that in recent years, we've had seven years in a row of these storms developing, and don't be surprised that there may be the chance that they bump these up the start of the official uh, hurricane season to May 15th. And we have already started with Anna. Next one on the list is Bill. And the potential for Bill is currently being looked at uh, with some of the longer range models in the Gulf of Mexico, potentially uh, in the next five to 10, uh, 15 days. Again, very early, very early here, but uh, it's something that we will closely watch for you, and I will very closely watch for you. Some of the models have been hinting at something in the southwestern Gulf, but if it happens, I'll let you know. So one thing going forward with the list of names that you will never hear is the Greek alphabet. We're done. What happened was the World Meteorological Organization realized that it's too confusing. We've had it over the years. And they felt that with the public, it, it just wasn't being handled well, and it was confusing people. So last year, with the 30 storms, we went through the entire list. We went halfway through the Greek alphabet. That's not going to happen anymore. So the Greek alphabet is done. They have retired that. Now what they're going to be using is what's referred to as a supplemental list of names. Almost think of it as a backup list of names. So if we go through the entire list, then we tap into this. And what I want to do right now is just to uh, finalize the presentation with if we are under a hurricane watch, what that means is that we would have hurricane conditions that are possible within the next 48 hours, and then if the computer models continue to trend towards our area, then that would get upgraded to a hurricane warning. But if we do have a hurricane that is heading our way, it's not just the physical storm that we would have to prep for, but it's also the, the psychological part of the storm. And the reason why, why people sometimes get nervous and scared and why anxiety levels go up with tropical systems, it's the unknown. What type of wind am I going to see? What type of surge? My job and my promise to you guys is that I will fill in those holes. I will tell you exactly what you need to know, and hopefully that can calm you down and we will get through the storm. So that is my promise to you guys. Thank you so much for having me. And as always, you can tune in at 5, 6, and 11. And if we have anything that comes our way, I will guide you through it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matt. Next up, we have Doug Barker from LCEC. Thank you all. Uh, I'm going to talk to you all about electricity, something that's near and dear to all of our hearts. And when there's no electricity, it, it isn't fun, right? Especially here in Southwest Florida. So I'm gonna start off with probably the most frequently asked question that we get at LCEC when it comes to, to relation to storms and especially hurricanes. When does LCEC turn the power off when the storm's coming? And the answer to that question is LCEC does not turn the power off during a hurricane or anything else. Mother Nature turns the power off. So if the power goes out, it's because 
Mother Nature took it down. The wind took it down. Trees took it down. And then, of course, it will stay off until we get through the storm. It's cleared, and then we can start running our crews out to do an uh, analyzation of what's out there, what needs to be fixed, and things in that fashion. So that's how that works. Uh, when we do restore power, we start off, obviously, with the, the main uh, arteries coming into the system, which would be our transmission lines, and then getting all of our substations powered up and getting them active again. From that point, it goes out to the distri distribution lines, out to the neighborhoods. Uh, and then from there, it goes to the individual consumers. We also target all of our uh, important loads like hospitals, uh, EMS, fire stations, police stations, things like that, to get them up and running as quickly as possible also, as long as the infrastructure is still there and still active. So what do we do if we're out of power? You need to start preparing now. Uh, this is the time to be out the shopping for your generators, and we know a lot of people are doing that right now. We see a lot of sales in the generators. And then, of course, how do we use the generators? There's two schools here. Uh, you could either spend the money and get a whole house generation system, which is automatic. Uh, as the power drops out, it stays off for a few minutes, it automatically starts up, powers your house. Those are, that's for the people that want everything in their home running. They want their AC. They want all the fans, the lights. They want all the refrigerators, freezers operating when they want them. No interruptions, just like the utilities providing power. And great system has to be maintained, has to be exercised throughout the year, and it's not cheap to do. It's going to be an expensive investment. But if that's the way you want to go, then it's great for it. There's another school of thought. It's about survivability. What can I do to get enough power to keep my food from spoiling? Maybe give me some lighting and some fans in the house. I can do without the AC for a couple of days, or I'll just get a portable air conditioner to stick in one room and have a cool room. And that's where the portable generator comes in. So that's very popular this time of year. We're seeing a lot of sales out there. There's a lot of things to take into consideration. Some of it is safety, and some of that has already been mentioned. Uh, you've got fuel to store. You're going to have to have gasoline cans. You're going to have to plan ahead on that. Where am I going to store that? When you're running your generator, carbon monoxide poisoning is very important. We see it happen almost every season. We have a hurricane. Somebody puts their generator in their garage and because they don't want it stolen, and they close the door, and of course then somebody ends up very sick or possibly dying from that. So carbon monoxide poisoning is very, very important. You want to make sure it's away from the house and it's the exhaust is pointing away from the house. Electrical. Uh, electrocution can happen very easily if you don't know what you're doing and you're using the wrong kind of cords and not <laughs> paying attention to that. For our crews working out in the uh, area, we're very concerned about generators too because if you're not connecting them correctly in your home, you can easily put the power right back out onto the lines and now our linemen are in danger. So our linemen are out there looking just like the firemen and the police force. They hear a generator. We're going to check it out before we get going. That could slow down the process of recovery, but it's a necessary thing to be safe. So. You want to make sure you do, do your research. We have a lot of information on our website at lcec.net. I suggest you go there and look at some of our information. Uh, you're going to have to take into account the size of your generator. So if you're just new at shopping for a generator, how do I go about that? Well, you're going to have to first look at the loads in your home. What do I need to run? I have a refrigerator. Maybe I have a freezer. Well, I can use my microwave to cook with. I can get by with that. Uh, I'm not going to run my central air. Or do you want to run your central air? So when you start putting those loads together, that's going to kind of determine the size of generator you can work with. Or if you already own a generator, you're going to have to utilize its output as your starting point and then determine what kind of loads you can use. So again, on our website, we have a uh, wattage worksheet we have underneath our general link se section 
and we'll give you some ideas of general loads of certain types of devices in your home and shows you how to add them up to determine what your load will be. And then from that point, maybe that's where you start as you shop for the generator. Or if you already own the generator, you realize, well, I can run my refrigerator, my freezer, and some lighting, but I can't run my water heater because that's going to trip it out. Well, then maybe you just turn everything else off for a little while, run your water heater for half an hour, turn it off. Now you've got a full tank of hot water. I can go back to running my refrigerator. So there's a lot to take in on this when you start talking a portable generator. So uh, extension cords. This is another thing. You're going to have that generator outside. You've got to get the power inside. There's multiple ways to do this that are safe and code compliant at the same time. Obviously, if you're going to be using uh, extension cords, make sure that they're large enough sized extension cords. And I'm talking about the wire size and the capacity of amperage you can put through them for the loads you have. Again, more fun with math when it comes to electricity. So you do your research uh, on that. Can't start too soon. But make sure they're in good, good working order. You know, uh, if their insulation's cracking on them and things like that, you could very well have uh, electrocution problems on that. So make sure that that's all done correctly. Make sure they're all grounded. They all are a three-pin type connector on those so that you're safe in that fashion. There's also ways to hook your generator into your power panel. Some are safe and some are not. Uh, make sure if you're going to be doing this that you get and talk to somebody like an electrician that is uh, licensed and knows what he's talking about. Uh, if you're going to add a type of sp a special panel or a transfer sh switch type panel, uh, they can lead you down the right direction on that. We at LCEC do offer one also uh, option to that, and uh, that's the Generalink system, which is a semi-automatic transfer switch that is installed right at your meter socket. Again, go to our website, lcec.net. You can read all about the information on that. Uh, that device is actually in the 2020 code book now, so it's, it's used as an approved method to uh, bring power into your home. So that's the kind of things you're going to want to look at. Obviously, cost always comes into play. How much money is it going to cost me to do this? So as you start doing your assessment of your home and making your plan, that's going to be half the part of that. You know, what, what do you have to invest in this? It's not just the generator. It could be extension cords. It's going to be gasoline cans for sure. Uh, or it could be propane, could be one of the dual fuels out there, but you're going to have to invest in all of that. So one word of caution I would say right now is if you don't have the generator and you're out there shopping, you better do it now, start now. And the reason is COVID has impacted a lot of manufacturers as far as their supply chain of parts. You're going to see a shortage of generators very soon. I would put money on it. Uh, as we get down there and other items like that. Uh, electrical costs have gone up dramatically. The cost of copper wire has gone up dramatically. So start looking into your plan. Don't wait to uh, August to do this. Uh, it's too late by August. Don't be trying to purchase something uh, five days before the hurricane hits. It's too late. Okay, so start now. Uh, also, I just want to keep reiterating the safety. You're going to have to store the fuel. Where are you going to store it? That's something that needs to be taken into consideration. And of course, uh, the, the carbon monoxide thing, we really want to stress that a lot. That's really important. So uh, I will be around here at the end for questions, if you have any questions on that. And I would just like to turn it right back over. Thank you, Doug. Next up, we have Bill Johnson from the Cape Coral Construction Industry Association. Um, you'll just use one. It's okay. on. Let's Perfect. Pull this up here. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you to all of those on Cape TV that are watching. Uh, my name is Bill Johnson, Jr. I am the executive director of the Cape Coral Construction Industry Association. The CCCIA, we are a nonprofit trade association that actually lobbies and is the advocate for the construction industry uh, within the city of Cape Coral. 
Um, we are currently celebrating our 50th year. Um, go past this one. We are in our 50th year of advocacy in Cape Coral. We have over 350 trusted members in our association, all the way from general contractors, subcontractors, your electricians, your plumbers, AC guys, all the way down to your title insurances, banks, uh, LCEC is a member. Uh, all of our members are vetted before we're approved, and we are closely associated with the city of Cape Coral. Um, we work with the building department, with the utilities department, fire department, police department. Um, what we are is we're that community advocate that is there for the construction industry throughout the year, and then we kind of kick it into storm road when we get into uh, hurricane season. Uh, we always stress, look up our members on our website, which is ccci.org, which is at the top. So your initial assessment, secure your building and clean up and restoration. Um, what I generally tell people is when you look at your initial assist assessment, you want to, well, let me take that back a step. Let me look at the preparedness portion of that. And what you want to do is when looking at getting prepared, um, we always tell people when you're, you know, most of the new homes that you're dealing with today have all the new shutters. People that are in the older homes have some of the older that they board up with plywood. Um, be very careful when you're putting it up because like Chief Lamb was saying earlier, it's normally during those summer months and it's hot out there. You know, fire does a real good job of going out and help assisting with that, but you, you have to be careful. Um, one of the things that we tell people is, you know, hurricanes are heavy rain events. So people think in their, you know, well, let me drain the pool a little bit because it's going to rain a lot, and I really don't want my backyard to flood. So I'm going to drain my pool and everything's going to be fine. Well, what most people don't realize is that a hurricane's a negative pressure system. And all of you that were around for Irma, when all the water got sucked out of the canals, what happened? The seawalls all towed in. We've actually seen, and I've seen photos of people that have released water out of their pool trying to be proactive, thinking that I'm going to avoid a flood in my backyard, and their pool shell actually pop out of the ground because of that negative pressure that is coming through. So preparedness is one thing. One of the things that we do um, with the CCCIA is when we get into the prepared mode, we did it during Irma, um, we always encourage all of our homeowners to make sure that you pull all of your outside furniture, secure all of your loose flow, you know, objects that can be turned into projectiles. Well, what we do is we work with the local building department in the city of Cape Coral and all of our contractors to make sure that, you know, you all see all of the construction sites that are out there nowadays. Building is going crazy. They're building homes everywhere. And what is on building sites? Job site materials. During Irma, we made a conscious effort and coordinated with fire, with PD, and with building to get a hold of all of those contractors to make sure that all of their job sites were secure, clean, um, we even had builders that had tile loaded in on the roof that they had to take that tile down because when you get into a situation where you have a wind event, um, as Matt was saying earlier, 145 miles an hour, well, guess what that roof tiles do on that roof that's stacked in? Those become projectiles that are now flung at your house, you know, two by four sheets of plywood. So we put forth a conscious effort to not only get with the community to secure your own home site, but to make sure that we as a industry take care of all the homes that are under construction going through there. So we get through and you look at your initial assessment afterwards. You know, we always say refer to our CCCI members to do that. Secure your home and building, you know, board up your windows. Make sure your power connections are, you know, like Chief Lamb and Alvin were saying earlier. A lot of people when the power goes out, they forget that things are left on. You know, we were talking about it earlier today. Um, we had a uh, presentation with a gentleman with IT. The last thing we forget about is our computers. Turn those off. Make sure they're raised up. Because if there does get into a storm surge situation and your house does flood, those electronics turn into that. Okay. Well, what you do is the, there you can get most of your home goods stores. Is, uh, the question was, who gets the tarps and who puts the tarps up afterwards? Most of your, like your Home Depots, your Lowe's, your hardware stores will have those. There are contractors, if you can't do it yourself, there are general contractors that will come around and will 
put those tarps and everything up to secure your roof if you do have any damage. And we'll, we'll get into that to, into a second as far as the unlicensed contracting. You know, water connections, neighborhood watch, you know, like Chief Sizemore said, make sure you know who your neighbors are because if you do leave, uh, the one thing that you want to make sure of is that you have that peace of mind that your home is your most valuable item. Um, cleanup and restoration, you know, one of the things that you have to be careful of if there is a situation where we do have flooding and your house did that. Um, we ran into it in back in ooh, 2004 with Wilma. I had slight roof damage in my house and I didn't even realize it, but water intruded in and probably about six months later we noticed this funky smell and we had mold coming down one of our walls. And it's making sure had I done the proper damage assessment and the cleanup afterwards to check for that, um, we wound up having to mitigate all of that. And it was an expense that, you know, fortunately insurance covered that, but it's something that you don't know of that you potentially could happen. Um, the great thing about a storm um, and working with the building department, and we, we thanked the city really stepped up after Irma. Um, as, they, as Chief Lamb and everyone said, we were very lucky that that storm shifted 40 miles to the east because had it done its original track, we would have had significantly more damage than we already had. What the city did do, though, is on certain things, fence permits, seawall permits, for a moratorium, I believe it was like three to six months, they waived all of those permit fees to help the community get back on their feet and sped through those and prioritized those specific style of permits so that recovery could take a front step and you know we like i said we are at the point where we are issuing a lot of permits the building department is tremendously busy but the city s took a step back and looked and said these were situations where we needed to figure out how can we get this accomplished quickly safely and the city really stepped up and said you know what we see that the community is hurting. We're going to waive all fees for a moratorium based on what was going on with fence permits, seawall permits, and et cetera. So this is the most important part of what I'm going to tell you tonight, and Chief Sizemore touched on it earlier. Unlicensed contractors. I call them cockroaches because that's what they are. What you will see is that these people will come in from anywhere. I mean, it's amazing when there's a natural disaster or a storm, what will happen is all of a sudden, two days later, you have pickup trucks rolling through neighborhoods and people trying to offer you services to fix that. Work is being done without the required permits. So basically what will happen is this. You will get into a situation where, say, your home is damaged. This is your most prized possession. As Chief Sizemore said earlier, emotions tend to run high. These people prey on that. They're looking at you in a heightened emotional state and you have a hole in your roof and they're going to come up and say, don't worry about that hole. We got crews. We can have someone out here tomorrow that's going to fix it. And you're like, really? And they're like, yep, we got that all taken care of. No problem. So you're like, well, what's it going to cost? Don't worry about the cost now. We'll get it fixed because we're going to have to do some repairs and possibly replace. And you're thinking, great, I don't have to worry. My roof's going to be fixed. So they get you initially on the, the initial hit with, we're going to type your roof and do that. Now, I'm not saying that there's not reputable contractors that react right away to do that, but you always have to be careful. A certified general contractor has to have a CGC number on their vehicle. It's a required by state law. They have to have it on the proposal that they give to you. They have to have it on their business card. Your certified electrical contractor, your certified plumbing contractor, your certified air conditioning contractor, these are all certified positions that is a state level license that these people have to maintain the proper workman's comp, liabilities insurance, and make sure they're properly doing that. What most of these unlicensed contractors do, they ha don't have that. So they're going to come in and they're going to tell you, eh, don't worry about that. I can get you a great deal. And you're in that heightened state of emotion. You're in the process of fighting with your insurance company. You have a hole in your roof. I just want to get it fixed. So what happens is they poor workmanship and here's the biggest thing and Chief Sizemore touched on it earlier what most people don't and I tell this to groups not even in hurricane season we see this with guys running up and down the street with tree cutting trucks I've 
have people that if you ever seen in your neighborhood, guy pulls up in a pickup truck and says, hey, you got three palm trees out in the front yard there. They look kind of shabby. Um, I can cut them down for 20 bucks a piece. And you're like, oh, 20 bucks a piece. My landscaping guy told me it would be like 50 bucks a piece. Sure, why not? Let me go ahead and do that. So you pay the guy, and nine times out of ten, the trees get cut, not a problem. Well, that one time out of ten, that guy's up with a chainsaw. He falls off the ladder. He cuts his leg with a chainsaw. Next thing you know, he's in the hospital, and guess what? He can sue you for your damages because he was on your property. Because you know what licensed contractors have to have? Workman's comp and liability insurance. That covers not only them, but that covers you guys to make sure that if something like that were to happen, you're not caught having to pay someone's bills. And believe me, we've heard horror stories of that going down. There's no recourse, as it says, to recover lost funds and damages. And nine times out of ten, there's no warranties. We had a situation with Irma where we had a homeowner that had roof damage. They came in, they had a contractor out of state, came in and fixed their roof. They pulled a permit, which they did it right thing, but out-of-state contractors don't know Florida building code. Our roofing contractors do. So when they improperly fixed that gentleman's roof and when the city came out to inspect it and they basically said, what's this? This is completely wrong. Um, no, this all has to be ripped off and redone. Well, guess where the contractor was? Nowhere to be found. And the city, in their right mind, couldn't pass that roof because no matter what, it has to be done right and it has to meet Florida building code because that is the building department's responsibility. That's why we have these codes. Hurricane Andrew, that changed the whole ball game. Before Hurricane Andrew, we didn't have nowhere near the structural wind loads that these houses have to take now. And that's why you'll see most of these new homes are built to withstand that 150 mile an hour hurricane. And a lot of the older homes in this city are not. Um, they are a danger. One of the things that we always say, ask to see the contractor's license. Ask for references. Certified general contractors don't have a problem showing your license. They work very hard to get that piece of paper. Um, it's their n name, reputation. And to ask for a reference, I can tell you of the 70 plus builder members that are members of my association, every single one of them wouldn't have a problem tomorrow if I said, hey, I need three or four people. Uh, can you give me a reference? Sure because that's how they build their reputation and do their business. Make sure the uh, license and numbers on all forms, all evidence, never pay up front. I always tell people, if the offer is too good to be true, then guess what? It's too good to be true because they, you know, we're not trying to scare you all. What we're trying to do is just put into the back of your mind, always be careful because these people do not care about you. They don't care about your home. All they care about is how's the quickest way that I'm going to take advantage of this person and do shoddy work and put money in my pocket. Um, a great way, you know, the city licensing, we work with the DBR to check. Um, it's always a good deal. It sounds too good to be true. Um, always get more than one estimate. Why not? I tell that to people on a normal thing. You always need to check out and see what the competition's doing. Um, be careful the door-to-door -door salespersons, like Chief Sizemore was saying. The old gypsy scheme, it happens. It, I've heard horror stories of it happening where people are in a heightened emotional state and they take advantage. One of the things that we always do, that's why we have been in this town for 50 years, and we pride ourselves on our member list, on our website, of having licensed, reputable contractors. Now, there's bad apples every now and then, yes. But we make it and we police ourselves to make sure that we keep that going in the right direction. You don't want these kids working on your house. Hire an unlicensed contractor. It definitely can be a disastrous thing. Uh, the city of Cape Coral is very proactive, and they do have two means unlicensed at capecoral.net if you see or have been taken advantage by an unlicensed contractor, and that's the number that you can call at the bottom. Um, I will be around for questions later. Thank you all very much. Don't be afraid, but be very careful because there's predators out there, and they take advantage of storm situations, and they are not scared to take your money at all. So thank you all, and have a great evening. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay, we are going to move on to our final two presenters today. Um, we're going to be having them join us virtually. 
So um, we mentioned earlier, but we're going to have two different cell phone applications um, speaking to us today. So first we will have Abigail Saunders of Waze. There she is. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear me. We can hear you. Awesome. And the, the presentation is good? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, um, hello. Uh, thanks for having me present today. My name is Abigail Saunders, and I am a volunteer for Waze. But I have been an app user and volunteering as a map editor and more, such as a partner coordinator and global champ, for 10 years now. Uh, today I will go over the various ways that ways can assist during a time of crisis. So what is ways and what is a crisis to us? So ways is the world's largest community-based traffic and navigation app. Waze helps people create local driving communities that work together to improve the quality of everyone's daily driving. Nothing can really beat real people working together. Waze is also home to an active community of online map editors who ensure that the map data in their area is as up-to-date as possible. So what is a crisis? An event that has had or is expected to have a significant negative impact on traffic and on the community. Uh, these would be hurricanes, earthquakes, chemical disasters, volcanoes, tsunamis, etc. So what are some more specific examples of a crisis that Waze has assisted with? Uh, one would be the California fires, a uh, California earthquake, a building collapse in Louisiana, and of course something we're all more familiar with, a uh, hurricane. Here's Hurricane Dorian. So some quick statistics for you on how many crisis events Waze has helped with over the last few years are shown here. Uh, we didn't include 2020 as many people weren't driving and the data is a little skewed while in a pandemic. So as you can see, it's gone up slowly over the years. And then 2019, there was 116. So you can see that it has increased. There uh, may have been more actual events, but also as more partners and people found out about them, we were told about more and able to assist with more. And here's a breakdown from the total, what type of crisis each was for. And tropical storm on the top right um, also includes hurricanes for the purposes of the slide. So you can see hurricanes, floods, storms, fires, uh, man-made, all sorts of things that we've helped with. So what are the goals for ways during a crisis? Well, our primary goal obviously is to help drivers stay safe, especially in these times of uncertainty. Uh, we try to pass along accurate and relevant information uh, from the partners to drivers as well. We collect information from drivers on the ground to help partners understand the wider state of affairs in real time. And we also provide partners with the tools to make data-driven decisions when the time is critical and results can be life-saving. So how do we support this, any of the crises? There's several items that we can do. There are road closures, shelters, evacuation zones, hazards and alerts, and gas availability data. And I'll go over each one of those. So road closures, um, they visually assist drivers if they're not actually routing to somewhere. And you can see the little icon, uh, little image on the left um, of somewhere in ways with a closure. The little red and white candy cane stripe indicates that. Um, but if you are routing to somewhere, like an address or a business, Waze will not suggest a route through that closure. When it's closed, it's closed. Now, how can closures be added? Um, they can be added from the app from drivers. They can be added by Waze map editors and they can be added by Waze partners. So speaking of Waze map editors, um, about six years ago, I led and organized a group of Waze USA volunteers to form a VEOC. That's a Virtual Emergency Operations Center. So anytime there is a crisis event, we activate the VEOC. This means that there is a large team from around the USA 
monitoring for road closures, shelters, key people, assisting partners, et cetera. Because normally the people that are involved in the crisis often can't help with the closures because they're evacuating themselves. The next way that Waze helps are shelters. So we place emergency and evacuation shelter pins on the map and drivers can interact with these pins. They can search for shelters, drive to them, call them, and get redirected to an official website. So how do these get added, you may wonder. Well, normally from the same group of Waze volunteer editors in the VEOC, by scouring official sites, working directly with partners to obtain lists, and then these are added to the Waze database by the volunteers. So this is an example of how many shelters can be added for one crisis. These were added in advance and some as they actually open. <laughs> and when they were no longer open, uh, Waze volunteer editors would update Waze to have them removed off the map and mark them as closed. So you can see with Dorian, she touched a lot of areas, uh, the Dominican Republic, Bahamas, Virginia, North Carolina, and then a few other stragglers. Evacuation zones. Uh, so if a driver's destination is in an evacuation zone, uh, they will receive a pop-up alert, and I'll show you one of those on the next slide. And then if the destination is not in the zone, Waze still will try to navigate around the zone if possible so you don't have people going in an evacuation zone when people are trying to leave. And so here you can see um, the navigation and uh, pop-up support that we have that if we get the areas in advance, someone will be asked if they're trying to route into or through an evacuation zone uh, this person's trying to route into it. So it says your destination is in a mandatory evacuation zone. Use extreme caution while driving. And it says continue drive and change destination. And then we also can offer pop-up support in real time or dynamic with evacuation zones. On this slide, you can see how many users saw and interacted with that evacuation warning pop-up for Hurricane Dorian in the app. You can see on September 3rd, about 100,000 drivers saw it on their phones when attempting the route. This is a very good thing as it will hopefully help make emergency services jobs a bit easier by having a few less people trying to route through or into an evacuation and they can concentrate on other priority items. Another way that um, Waze helps is with our hazards and alerts. So in addition to everything else that I've already gone over, uh, we can do push and inbox messages on the Waze app in your phone. Then we can also, we do the shelter pins on the map. And when you see one on the map, you can actually tap it and interact with it, as you can see in this middle image. And then the, we also do social media and PR. Uh, the image on the right is actually of a Twitter announcement about trying to find an evacuation center. And then finally, um, the final way that Waze assists in a time of crisis is gas availability data. So every day drivers are able to update gas prices on the app. However, drivers are also able to mark if a station is out of gas. So this becomes especially helpful if something major or crisis occurs, you know, such as panic buying for a pipeline that was hacked and stations are rapidly running out of gas. It is also obviously useful for when a storm is coming and drivers are trying to prepare. And you can see by the above image that how easy it is to do this from the Waze app. So I hope that this presentation was useful and you enjoyed learning about all the different ways that Waze can help during a crisis event. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Abigail, Thank for you so joining us. Okay, as she kind of wrapped up with gas availability, our final speaker is going to be Patrick DeHaan from Gas Buddy. He will also be joining us virtually tonight. Hi there, thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna present a little bit about uh, what Gas Buddy has done here in the past in terms of fuel availability. Uh, we are um, certainly at top of mind when it comes to uh, those types of issues. So uh, let me get my presentation going here. And just kind of go over, I think 
most of you are, may be familiar with Gas Buddy um, during Hurricane Harvey and Irma back in 2017, obviously. Um, certainly sizable events that led to a significant amount of evacuations. And of course, the challenges that uh, came with it. Um, of course, um, you know, smartphone really, uh, smartphones really uh, enable people to find so many things during uh, emergencies. Uh, obviously, in 2017, Gas Buddy and Zello were at the top of mind, turning your mobile phone into a radio. Uh, smartphones have really enabled a lot of information, a lot of new abilities in the age of hurricanes, and they've been so extremely helpful. But what about gasoline? Uh, fuel is often now at top of mind with consumers once they hear a word hurricane or once there's an outage. Um, as we've seen with the Colonial Pipeline outage here in the last couple of weeks, fuel shortages can be severe during hurricanes and other outages. Um, supply issues, demand surging because of panic buying, um, other logistical challenges, getting barges into the state of Florida when ports are closed. All of these can turn into challenges. Um, drivers driving around looking for gas, not really so efficient, not really so safe, especially in the midst of evacuation orders. Uh, gas Buddy uh, realized that we could do something back in 2012. Uh, we worked with uh, New York authorities, the White House, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, we enabled uh, a feature on our app. And if anyone has the free Gas Buddy app, these tools can be enabled uh, during hurricanes. I'm our head of petroleum analysis at Gas Buddy. I'm constantly watching for potential issues that could disrupt the normal flow of fuel. Um, every June 1st through September, well, actually through November, um, through the end of hurricane season. This is something that we're constantly monitoring. Um, the National Hurricane Center, we're looking for potential issues that could cause disruption. And we realized with our smartphone app that we have the power to enable these features. We crowdsource our pricing data already, but why not layer fuel availability tracking into that? And that's exactly what we did. So now using the Gas Buddy app, you can actually find gasoline, diesel fuel we added in 2017, whether station has power or not. These are all things that people can search for using our app uh, effective a couple of years ago. And like I said, this is all specific to an area that is seeing disruption. That is, these features aren't always enabled. This is human intervention. I sit here and look for outages we activate these states on a manual basis. So if there is no crisis happening, these tools aren't necessarily uh, readily visible on the app. They're always there. Uh, but when we activate, this is exactly on the right side what people will see. They will be asked, does the station have fuel? Does it have power? Does it have diesel? And this is something that's baked into our app. It all also can be found on the web, uh, tracker.gasbuddy.com for those that don't have smartphone apps. Uh, and this is exactly what it looks like. Uh, very easily, motorists can pull up the Gas Buddy app. They can find on the, the picture on the left, those stations in red do not have fuel. A lot of this is crowdsourced. Um, during times of disruption, if we have kind of a heads up, uh, we have synced up with partners, that is C stores directly, to get this information directly from the source and to get it out to users. So. It's not always the same situation. Uh, we have partners in Florida because of hurricanes in the past, like I said, Hurricane Harvey and Irma, that we've worked with to get this fuel availability information directly from them. But oftentimes it's crowdsourced, but it's still enabled on the app and it's still on the web for those that don't have a smartphone. In addition, like I mentioned, we work with retail partners directly. Uh, think of some of the larger C-store chains uh, Speedway, Wawa, Sheets, Trow, uh, uh, Pilot Flying J, Loves. There's a lot of retailers that have more than one store in the state of Florida. Uh, we made these tools free during Irma. That is, they could go into our system and update or send us a database of stations that had fuel. So whether you're a first responder uh, or government making decisions on this data, uh, this data is available uh, via multitude of sources. Uh, we work with higher level authorities, 
the Department of Energy, whether it be the state of Florida EOC, when activated, we work with the ESF-12 team. Uh, you'll see on the right, that was uh, exactly a screenshot from Hurricane Irma back in 2017. So that state authorities could provide that information to partners on where to direct fuel. Uh, fleet operators could direct first responders where to fill up. Uh, some of our partners were making pumps available to first responders only so that they had fuel. But all of this has been complementary during times that we are activated. And that would be like a, a major hurricane that uh, has a severe threat on gasoline supply. Uh, back in 2017, we went down to Florida to be um, integrated into the SF-12 team. On the lower left, you'll see some of what that outage data looks like. And I think during the colonial outage that we saw here just a few weeks ago, if anything, we can see these situations escalate very quickly. Um, we're happy to help, whether it's state or federal agencies, uh, on getting you this critical data on fuel outages, power outages, what stations have diesel. Um, that was something, like I said, we added in 2017, just because of the amount of utilities and first responders that require diesel. Uh, this is something that anyone in your, uh, on your team can download to their own smartphone, whether that be county issued, city issued, state issued, um, as long as they can download apps, they can get that Gas Buddy app and get the information right on their own device. Like I said, we also provide this information free of charge to various counties, uh, state level, the ESF 12 team in Florida, um, so that they can make better decisions on where to direct resources during these times of emergency, um, whether that's routing more fuel to a, a, a interstate corridor uh, or a different corridor on the east or west side, depending on where that hurricane is, we make this data available uh, to just about anyone. And, you know, kind of wrapping it up in 2017, uh, obviously a very trying situation with Harvey and, and then Irma right after, um, highlighting the information that we have available uh, to help get people out of harm's way. We were happy to do so. Um, that's what our team is here for, and we're happy to provide this service going forward, whether it be states that look for this data or if your first responder is looking for fuel as well. We have uh, plenty of resources available to help you find that fuel. And just kind of a couple uh, couple testimonials here. I think a lot of, of uh, our team really enjoyed being able to help uh, Floridians in 2017 get out of harm's way. Um, and we're happy to do the same uh, in your area. So if there's any questions, but uh, back to you, Carolyn, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us, Patrick. Um, do we have any questions before, or for Patrick or any of our other guest speakers before we wrap up? Yes, I have one over here. I'm okay. In regards to the generators, we put fresh fuel in it, how long does that fuel stay before it starts to turn to gum and varnish? I was told three months. If you put stabilizer in, it's good for a year. Uh, I'd just like some confirmation on that, please. Um, I'm assuming that question is for me. Um, oh, sorry, that was very loud. Um, was that aimed at Patrick Jahan from Gas Buddy or over with um, LCAC in regards to the generator? <laughs> um, Patrick, it's okay. We'll have um, Doug Barker, if that's okay, over here answer that one. I'm not a fuel expert. Okay, that works too. Well, Patrick, if you have the answer for that one, then. <laughs> Uh, it generally depends on the time of year you're buying that fuel. If that's summer gasoline, it probably could go about six months. Uh, winter gasoline is a little bit more volatile. You may find it three to five months. But yeah, with stabilizer, some of these fuels can go six to nine months. It's really just depending on the time of year. If, you, if it's summer gasoline, it tends to go a little bit longer. It's less volatile. Thank you very much. Um, is it for... Perfect. Um, are there any more questions for Patrick Jahan or Abigail Saunders online um, before we wrap up and we can let them leave off the Microsoft Teams? 
Okay, um, so we will conclude with that one. Thank you so much to our online presenters. We greatly appreciate it, and thank you, you know, so much more for our in person as well. We appreciate you guys coming out here and taking the time, um, and thank you all for attending here today. I also like to thank the emergency management team as well as our volunteers for helping this event be possible. Um, we do have tabling set up outside, so I will have the presenters that are in person please head to their tables or out to the lobby to answer additional questions. And then I will also ask the presenters to stay just a few more minutes after that to take one last group picture. Excellent, qu excellent question, uh, and I'll just re rephrase it. Uh, during hurricanes, when cell tires go down, what have the cell providers been doing to harden their uh, systems? Uh, they've been doing a lot of different work, uh, having their entire buildings uh, almost encased by concrete now. Uh, they have a generator on site. A lot of them work with the uh, electric supply companies to have two services legs come in some have a line a line b uh you know I, I know the county has spent a lot of money upgrading the radio communication system for public safety entities i know just at our emergency operations center uh here across the street their facility is truly battle hardened it, it's uh i think the footer was about five foot high solid concrete uh, so it is elevated uh, for that storm surge, but also additional power capabilities to it, a f uh, fixed generator on the building, plus capability of bringing in uh, generators that are trailer mounted. Uh, we have worked very closely with some of the providers, uh, for example, that they can actually bring in what they call a cell on wheels. So if they have lost any of their infrastructure, they can actually come up and do what's called a bubble cell service. and do a mesh network from that. So a lot of them have response vehicles that they'll actually put up that cell service. It's a smaller footprint, if you will, but then they can have multiple vehicles going out and mesh them together to provide that cell service. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, again, uh, we have uh, the table set up out there. Thank you again to all the uh, presenters this evening. Caroline Brioni's excellent job uh, being our MC and coordinating all the efforts. Thank you and have a safe trip home.